Are you drawn to power, belonging, or even just popularity, like being liked? You know, in today's video, I actually want to give you the secret to true likability, how others will like you, how to maximize power, how to maximize popularity. And I want you to know that you're not alone in that desire. The fact is we all have a deep rooted attraction towards things like power, self-preservation, and even a desire to just simply be known. In fact, that's why I think we have such a deep fascination with those that are in power. Maybe you're a history buff, you love studying the American government, or even ancient kings. Kings are the actually, actually the embodiment of strength and leadership, their grandeur, their authority. It mesmerizes us, gives us a sparkling sense of awe and admiration. I want to make sure that you stick around to the very end of this video because I'm going to talk to you about the surprising response that we should all have especially if we're hoping for and waiting for power and popularity. So we're starting a little video playlist series called Kings, and we're gonna be exploring how to make the most of the hand that you're dealt. Maybe when you think of the word kings, these are some of the things that come to mind. Maybe like the Sacramento Kings with De'Aaron Fox and DeMontis Sabonis. I'm a big basketball fan, so that's where my brain first goes, right? Or maybe for you, you're like a King Arthur and Knights of the Round Table kind of person. Or maybe when I say king, you think like chess. The king and the queen and the rook and the bishop and the pawn and the knight and all those things, right? But what if I... What if we played a little round of like family feud? The fact is, you would probably, if I asked you for a list of kings of ancient Israel, name a king of Israel. David. You would probably not get too many guesses in before you came to the name King David. But before David was a king, he quite famously defeated a giant, Goliath. And if you have no church or Bible background, you at least have probably heard of David and Goliath. David was a king, but becoming king didn't happen overnight. And that's actually what I want to explore today, his journey to becoming a king. Because before David uh, defeated Goliath, he was a shepherd. And before David ever even emerged onto the scene, we have a guy in the Bible in the book of 1 Samuel called Samuel. So let me give you just a quick kind of crash course history lesson on the different kings of Israel. Samuel was the final judge of Israel. And they switched over from this ruling structure of from judges to kings. And so Samuel anointed this king named Saul. Long story short, Saul disobeyed, and God then gave Samuel a new assignment to anoint a new king of Israel. Samuel is instructed to go to a house, the house of Jesse. When he gets there, he sees David's brother named Eliab. And, you know, Eliab must have been a football player or something, because based on looks alone, Samuel said this. He said, surely this is the Lord's anointed. I want you to check out uh, 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. It's going to be up here on the screen. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height. I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. See, people, they look at the outward appearance, but the Lord, the Lord looks at the heart. This cycle happens seven, seven times with Jesse's kids. Until Samuel asks in verse 11, are, is, are these all the sons that you have, Jesse? And Jesse says, well, wait, there's the youngest, David. Side note, how horrible that David's dad didn't even consider or introduce him to Samuel. Like, how horrible of a feeling do you think that must have been for David growing up or where he was in his life that he wasn't even considered? And if you would have remembered David, right? Give us a like and a subscribe because that would be great. And this is only week one of four. We're going to be exploring kings from the Old Testament and some are even more unique and niche and less known than David. So I want you to learn about them. But we wouldn't have forgotten David, but Jesse did. The problem, even in his own dad's head with David, was that David, he's, he's just a teenager. And he's a smelly shepherd and he's the runt of the litter. He's smaller than the rest of his brothers. And so it, it you couldn't possibly have been him that Samuel was looking for. I guess, you know, here, we'll give it a shot. Check this out. So he sent for him, sent for David, and had him brought 
in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, David, in the presence of his brothers and his dad. And from, the day on, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. We're going to fast forward now up to the next chapter. And in that chapter, we see David defeat Goliath. And you all have heard that story, know that story. But essentially what happens now is really important because David becomes a national hero. So much so that all the people actually start making up a song comparing David, the soon to be anointed but unknown to others at this point, king of Israel, to the current king of Israel. Remember the guy Saul. And it says this in 1 Samuel 18, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. See, ironically, while David was considered small and young, Saul was a man's man. Saul was like Eliab. He must have been a football player, tall and handsome. It says that uh, Saul stood a whole head taller than anyone else in Israel. He was incredible, right? But Saul and David in physical appearance could not look any more different. But despite that, right? Despite the fact that Saul had all these things, his jealousy began to get the best of him. And from this point forward, a root of bitterness and jealousy is planted inside Saul and becomes a hindrance, honestly, to him for the rest of his life. You see, David had already, unbeknownst to Saul, been anointed as king. And so now he's got an enemy, Saul, who just so happens to be the most powerful person in all of Israel because he's the current king. And so, so, so far in David's life, we've inspected and taken a look at chapters 16, 17, and 18 of 1 Samuel. David doesn't take the throne until 2 Samuel chapter 1. That means chapters 18 through 31 are spent following the, the chase between Saul and David, who are kind of in a feud with one another. And scholars aren't all lined up on this, but it's estimated that that is a time period of seven years. That's more than twice some of y'all's ages. Now, one of the unique things about the entire life of David is that in particular, David wrote many of the Psalms that we have now in our Bible. And so because of that, we can actually get a glimpse into the thoughts that David was having during these seven years, during the moments when he was running from Saul. You see, Psalms almost serves as David's diary at times. And so in the header of my Bible, it says that David wrote this when Saul had sent men to watch David's house and to kill him. So just put yourself in that spot for just a minute, right? What would you be thinking? What would you be feeling? Check out how David responds and how he talks to God in Psalm 59. He said, be my fortress against those attacking me. In verse 1, you are my strength and I watch for you. Verse 9, I sing praise to you, my God, on whom I can rely. That's in verse 17. David's approach as future king was one of patience and trust and faithfulness in God serving of him. See, despite being told and anointed as king, David trusted God's timing and he didn't take matters into his own hands, which I'm sure would have been a really tempting thing to do. You know, so much so, there's actually a story in 1 Samuel 24, Saul is taking a giant poop. I mean, really, that's exactly what is happening. He's in a cave and David just so happened to be hiding in that same cave. Saul didn't know it, so he goes in there, he takes the poop and all of David's men are saying, hey, go, go, now is your time. Go kill him, then you'll be king. Check out what they say to him. This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you that I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Let's be honest, it even sounds like this is semi-spiritual advice. God has said this to David, but despite what David's men and advisors are telling him, David, all he did was go up to Saul, and Saul didn't know, and he cut off a little corner of Saul's robe just to kind of prove, right? Prove I was there, I could have gotten you, but I didn't. And I would imagine for you and for me and for most of us, that if we saw Saul in front of us and we had this opportunity to now finally become king and end this chase, we would do it. But look at what Psalm 59.9 says. God was David's strength. 
He watches for God. And here's the truth. I don't know what you are carrying watching this YouTube video, waiting on or hoping for, but you can take a page out of David's playbook and exhibit patience. One of my favorite family vacations is going to Disney World. Last year, we surprised our boys with the trip. Check it out. What does that say? That's going to Disney World. No right, right now? You're coming too. Do you want to go to Disney World with Dad right now? We're going to Disney World right now. Your bags are packed. Everything's ready. Do not get light leaves in one hour. When we booked it, as soon as we booked it, it was eight weeks in advance. I was ready to go that day. I thought about that trip every single day. I talked about it every single day. The anticipation inside of me was incredible. The amount of planning that I did, the surprises that I had for my boys and also for my wife. Oh man, it was going to be so great. I had to exhibit patience. I did a really bad job of it right? Because I knew what was ahead of me and I couldn't wait for the opportunity. But maybe, just maybe, I want to challenge you to be like David and ask God this week where he may be asking you to show and exhibit some patience. Because here's the bottom line. Sometimes God's plan can demand patience. How did David exhibit and carry out the patience that was required in his life? Well, just go read the book of Psalms. You'll see example after example of David calling out and crying out to God. Sure, whatever you're going through that seems hard and is causing you to want to hit the speed up button, it's truly difficult. I'm not diminishing it. But David didn't give God a filtered version of his feelings, a, a church Sunday morning fake version. He brought his unfiltered feelings and thoughts to God. And he did that. And God gave him the patience that he needed to endure this. The patience to wait on becoming king. The patience to serve God faithfully even in the midst of adversity. The patience to realize that God and God's timing was the best. So what this week would it look like for you to maybe have a conversation with somebody, maybe even right now to reach out and text them if there's an area in your life that you're feeling impatient? How could you dial into God's plan for you and choose to be intentional about the time that you spend with God? Because here's what we know. God's plan can demand patience. Speaking of patience, you don't have to wait any longer because the very next video in this playlist is right here on the screen. Click that, check it out as we explore making the most of the hands that you're dealt in this playlist called Kings, and we'll see you next time.